Hi there, everybody. Uh, first, I'm going to take a selfie. There you go. All right. So now, uh, for the application developers for mobile side, I need your help to keep it on my phone. Make sure Dr. Evil doesn't take it off my phone, right? So, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is security testing for uh, servers, web, and mobile applications. Uh, next slide, Darren. So um, sure, there's some credentials on there. Really, uh, the credentials that I would say matter to most of the folks here today would be the CEH, while there's other stuff, but more for the hands-on security piece. Um, I'll get into more pieces of the uh, certifications uh, later on this in the slide deck. Next slide, please. All right, so we're going to overview what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about the intrusion kill chain. It's a uh, model that we'll talk about. Uh, we'll talk about some mobile security stats and back office security stats. And before I get into those numbers, I want to make sure everybody understands these numbers come from different industry reports. Uh, so they, each industry report may have its own skew, right, its own perspective. So take it with a grain of salt and really research on your own. Look at the different reports that are out there to see if, uh, say, Sophos is doing the same thing that Ftrends is doing um, or reporting on. I'll also provide you a list of some free security testing um, tools, uh, resources that you can use to test your stuff. Um, and then I'll also talk about some security-related testing, uh, uh, security-related certifications. So, so that's what we're going to talk about here. Uh, next. So the first thing we're going to talk about here is the uh, intrusion kill chain. This is a theoretical model that goes off the axiom of the weakest link in a chain, right? Or the weakest, excuse me, uh, the weakest link in a chain can break the chain, right? So we look at this from the perspective of an attacker. So each of these phases describes how, is an, how an attacker can actually get into your enterprise, right? So the reconnaissance, so maybe they want to get into whether it's a big organization and understand, say, Microsoft uh, uses a lot of Microsoft tools. So they'll identify uh, their targets to say, hey, I'm going to go after some Microsoft platforms, whether they want to send a phishing email to people that at Microsoft.com. Um, or if it's a single user, maybe it's a big fish, a whale, so to speak, uh, where they'll say, I want to go after a CEO of a company. Um, so they look for social, prof uh, uh, social networking profiles to go after that big whale, right? So there's different things you can target, whether it's an individual or an organization or a platform. Once they understand that, then they will work to weaponize a certain attack vector, right? So they'll figure if they're going to go and deliver a malware through a PDF, right? Or if they want to, and that's a great attack vector if they're going to send an email to somebody like that whaling attack I described. Or if they want to go after a certain website, they've already done the reconnaissance to find out that it's running an older version of IIS or an older version of Apache. So after they've figured out how to weaponize uh, the remote access that's really uh, taking the remote access malware, a Trojan, I should have asked this. How many folks speak security in here? Right? So um, how many folks do we have that are Android developers? OK, interesting. All right, um, so when I, look at that, when I look at that, there wasn't a lot of developers. But when I say you know, Android or who speaks security, I didn't see as many hands. So I'm going to make sure if you have any questions, raise your hand or just shout at me, hey, what are you talking about here, right? So we're going to talk about weaponization. So pairing remote access malware, that's just a piece of software that allows an attacker to get uh, access to your device, your handset, your laptop, a server, um, and pairing that with some other payload or, or some other uh, 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 deliverable payload, like a PDF, a dot, uh, executable, an APK file, right? So then next is delivery is figuring out how we're going to get that malware to the target, whether it's going to be through a USB drive, an email, uh, a web exploit, right? Maybe I can convince you to go to my malicious server to download this stuff. Um, so the next part of that kill chain, exploitation, right? So once we get that code, that piece of malware onto your device, how do we get it to install the goods, right? How do we get it to have the rights to actually act as an administrator? So for the uh, developers in the, in, the house, in, the, in the house here, how many of you have uh, run most of your work with admin rights? Right? It's practice, right? Thank you, Aaron. Right? Sure. Right? So that's one of the ways if you are running uh, at, with admin rights and you open up that malware PDF, that malware is going to be able to install on your system with the same rights that you have versus if you run as a user. 
So uh, the next step in that chain is installation. So now after it's, that malware has the rights to actually install the goods, it's going to install the goods. It's going to give it that backdoor access to your system. It's going to then say, OK, now that I, I have access and I, I have persistent uh, access to your system, I'm going to go on to the next step, which is command and control. Now I can control your phone. And why should we care, right? Well, what do you think of somebody? Yeah, you're like, not my phone. Um, why should we care? Well, what if they can hear your conversations? Use your camera. Right? Um, look at your GPS location. Combine all of these things. Look at all the phones we have in this room. That's a lot of data to get into the hands of Dr. Evil. So, and then of course the last thing is, is actions on objective. It varies on what the intent of the attacker is. Right? So if it's going to be, uh, if they want to exfiltrate data from your environment, maybe they want SSNs, credit card data. Right? Maybe they want to just be really annoying, DDoS. Right? Maybe they want to shut down your system. Maybe they want to lock you out of your system to make a point, ransomware. Uh, has anybody heard of CryptoLocker? Anybody not heard of CryptoLocker? Right? Okay, CryptoLocker, it's a nasty piece of malware uh, that on your laptop it can say, hey, you don't get, you, uh, you don't get any access to, unless you pay me money. Right? Imagine that, all your pictures, your phones, your doc or your phone numbers, documents, contacts, everything locked out. There was also a variant for the, uh, for the phone. Darren, what was the variant for CryptoLocker on the phone? Do you remember that? Yeah, uh, like Thank you. Yeah, same thing. So what you normally see on those laptops transitions off to our devices, and we're going to get into that next. So that's the attack uh, or the intrusion kill chain. I want you to understand this chain of events as we go through and see why these numbers and why, why these other uh, bits and pieces of information are going to be important. Next slide, please. So we talked about phones, uh, uh, and I took a selfie. Think about all the other things you have on your phone and what your phone collects. Right? So your, your phones are collecting location. Where am I? Right? Um, uh, what's my wireless carrier? Uh, last known location. These are, you may think this is not really valuable information, but when we start to commoditize that information, larger groups of data, I think certain people would be interested in understanding market sentiment. What are these consumers doing? Right? Uh, or even if they're starting to profile somebody, where does John Smith go every day? Let me see the trail of, of his location so I know when he's not home. Um, so, so that's why I want you to understand if, if there is anything for this uh, particular slide, become informed. Join the, the, the conversation. Google out mobile security reports, or even just in general security reports, if you're, if you're not focused on mobile, to get a good feel of what's going on out there, the different trends. Go for the latest reports. Um, and if, if that doesn't put you to sleep, I don't know what will, right? So next slide, please. So here we are talking about Android security. And I just want to really put things in perspective. Up until spring of 2012, this conversation really wasn't an important one. But over the course of the last two years, we went from very low stats to, in 2014, more than 650,000 pieces of malware uh, for Android alone have been um, sampled. That's a lot, right? So the bad guys are really fast at, at developing all of these different malware. Um, still, it's very uh, just a fraction of what we see on our laptops and on our servers. Um, but still, that rate is just incredible. It shows somebody's really busy, right? Um, and, and here we are celebrating the 10-year anniversary of the first worm that affected the Symbian devices. Um, so next slide, please. So out of uh, the, what we just saw on that last slide, uh, and this is a separate report, and this is where those numbers vary a bit. We saw 650,000 samples of malware, yet this report from F-Secure shows that we're only positioned uh, to detect, and this was in Q3 of 13, about 55,000 55, of those. It really echoes that the bad guys are making it faster than we can detect the stuff. So it's, it's really a challenge because you, you have to understand, is this phone infected? Most folks aren't even going to know. Maybe their phone's acting a little funny, and they just say that's a glitch, right? So it takes a while before uh, the folks out there can see, well, well, this phone is really misbehaving. It's calling home to a country that I've never communicated with before, right? Um, and out of those malware uh, threats that they've detected and since Q3 2013, 88% are those backdoors I was telling you about, the Trojans. Um, I'm going to go and pretend I am this, but you're going to actually download that. Um, so it really, it's uh, APKs that misrepresent themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So from the perspective of, well, Brian, how does this really affect me or my company, right, or even my home? Uh, you know, I, I run a firewall at home, or we have a firewall at the company. I, I just met somebody in the NOC. Jefferson, you work in the NOC, right? So, um, so he, and, and I also heard from Michael Egan in the back there, uh, the challenges of firewall rules and making sure there's a, you have the right firewall rules up to allow the good stuff in and the bad stuff out. 
but here we are over here on my handset, right? How am I going to get something over here on my personal device over here? Well, from an Android developer perspective, if the applications are not developed secure enough, they can allow, uh, or if the phone's not configured uh, secure enough, they can allow malware onto my, home, onto my personal device. But then I'm going to go ahead and use that touchdown app to go and check my email at work. And while I'm doing that, it's capture my credentials, right? So even though I have protections up here that say you must authenticate, now the bad guys have the keys to the kingdom to get into the enterprise. So hopefully, I'm not running as an administrator, right? So at least if they get the keys to the kingdom, they're only getting the stuff I have, right? So, so that's how they can get into the enterprise and why we care about it from the end to end. Next slide, please. So some other stats we have here is on the mobile application vulnerabilities. So is anybody who's not familiar with the OWASP top 10 or OWASP top 25? Okay, open web application security uh, project. So what it is is a, a program where folks have said, hey, here's the top vulnerabilities. If you're gonna fix anything in your web application, these are the issues you wanna fix, right? And they categorize those, uh, whether it's um, session management, cross-site scripting, authentication. I'm gonna take a drink of water here. So on the application, mobile applications detected category in 2013, we see that infrastructure, that's your phones themselves, right? So there were a lot of fixes. Has anybody on their Android devices not seen where uh, you have a mobile update? I kind of like those because it feels like I get a new phone afterwards. Right, they'll toss in some fun stuff as well. So, uh, so then after infrastructure, sure, you're dealing with privacy violations, input validation errors. So that's on the mobile application themselves. And then over here, we're looking at on the web application side of the house. This is the probability, okay? This isn't a, a particular number. This is the probability of finding these vulnerabilities on applications. So it shows over the years, 2011 through 13, uh, represented by the darkest bar there, um, where we were at in terms of managing these types of vulnerabilities on our applications and what's most prevalent out there. Um, we can get into how to prevent each of these attacks, but there's not enough time in this evening to go through that. But I would recommend checking out OWASP. It really gets into it. So if you go to OWASP.org, it will really get into here's how you can prevent these uh, vulnerabilities from occurring on your systems. Uh, there's also a group here in Seattle as well. So next slide, please. So one of the key things is infrastructure. Uh, so one of the things I, I, I try to bat home is, is we got to keep our OS patches, right? Keep the Microsoft patch, keep the Red Hat, the Unix patch. Um, but I started in the research, that's only 10% of the issue, right? The larger part of the issue is the applications. It's the .NET, it's the Java, it's the Adobe Flash, Adobe Reader, right? So that's what folks are going after, right? So it's hard to go after. I haven't seen a good attack on an OS in a while, but there's a lot of stuff in the application space, right? So, so as we're doing this and as application developers, uh, it's really important to think about your dependencies, not just the operating systems that you're working on, uh, that you're putting your platforms on top of, but also the applications uh, for the, uh, that you are depending on, whether it's uh, .NET, uh, C++, uh, uh, Apache, IS, all those different applications to make sure that those are fully patched and securely configured as well. Next slide, please. Now, 2012 was the number I was able to find. I'm sure if I dug in, we can make a, a newer analysis. But what's key here is I just want to show you, when we look at 2011, you can't really read that, the stats for number of highs. The two winners that got, the, the winner and loser, Apple iOS was the highest. And again, check your stats with other stuff, right? Just looking at what I'm seeing here. And, and think about why that might have happened in your, in your own story of your mind, right? So Apple iOS really was the winner for the most increases in number of high vulnerabilities in 2012, whereas the winner of the least amount of vulnerabilities disclosed was the Windows 2003 server. All right, now I don't know if that was because, hey, end of life was coming right around the corner, and maybe some folks said, well, you know what, maybe this vulnerability is worth more after end of support, right? Um, who knows? But I just want you to think about that. So have the have the numbers speak for themselves. Next slide, please. So what do we do? So if you're really funded for security, then sure, get security tools. If you're not, get the same tools. Just call them defect tools, right? Defect detection tools. So it's a problem whether it's security or development or infrastructure. It's a defect. It's not a security vulnerability per se. It's more of the system is not operating the way it should. So what can we do about, how do, how do we find these vulnerabilities? Uh, so the way we find these vulnerabilities is A, option A, you can pay somebody to do that for you. Like, I changed the oil on my car. Who changed the oil on the car? 
Who pays to have the oil on their car change? Adam, you need to learn to change the oil on your car. But really what you can do here is I'm recommending is learn how to change the oil yourself because doing the first way is kind of painful. You're going to say, sure, I'm going to have to find a vendor that I can trust to scan my stuff. I need them to scan not just my web application. I need them to scan my servers, right? I need them to scan the interfaces. I may need them to do a perimeter scan of my entire enterprise, right? That's going to cost a lot of money and time. And then back and forth with scheduling. Uh, and uh, so then after that, we uh, wait for the results. And then we have to go and verify those results, right? So we have to say, well, is this false positive? And check all that stuff, going back and forth. And I'm sure that's uh, probably uh, uh, not going to be one of those free services they provide. Uh, then validating, after we go at validating, implement the fixes. Right, so when we wa we talked about that OWASP top 10 and OWASP top 25 stuff, right? It's not all just about a missing patch. There's things you can do such as um, hardening your servers, right? Uh, so there's a uh, website. So another one for you is the CIS benchmarks. Okay, that really speaks to how to harden servers, your platforms, your databases. Hardening means securing the configuration so to make it harder for attackers to get in there. It's not it's not just keeping them fully patched. Um, so after we go ahead and implement the fixes, whether it's a configuration or a patch, then rinse and repeat with this third party provider. So that's more money, extended time to market, et cetera. Or we can change the oil ourselves, right? So start improving your time to market and improving the ability de to detect defects in your systems, right? Be able to say, hey, I'm closer to the system now because I know about its weaknesses. I'm really position you to be informed about the risks, not some third party that may have you chasing down a, a red herring, right? So um, maintain your customer trust. Uh, back in the day, I'm sure there, it took a while for a, a couple of elevators to hit the ground before they made it mandatory to put that sticker in there that says, hey, it's been rated to hold eight people, right? Do that for your customers. Think about the trust that you want to maintain with them. So what you're going to do is you're going to say, I'm going to put this star. That means this star, at a very minimum, I've done my checks on my system. I've done the web application scans. I've done the host vulnerability scans. I've done some server hardening. I've looked at it, right? And I'm not saying throw the whole kitchen sink at it, because unfortunately, the more security you toss at something, the less functionality you may ha have out of it. And in this day of pervasive apps and, 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 and flow of data, you don't want to restrict that innovation, right? So there's that balanced approach. So, if you're fully satisfied with your results, then bring on the testers. So instead of having them scan everything, you're having them scan this piece that you're really focused, you know everything else is groovy, this is the piece I really need them to look at, right? Next slide, please. So the idea, all right, there's Dr. Evil, my favorite guy. So know your systems and apps, subscribe to patch notifications, test for missing patches, and test, test fixes prior to deployment. So next slide. What I mean by know your systems and apps, and there's a freeware tool that can help you with this at the bottom here, right? So in these slide decks, I think are going to be available, Aaron, when we're done. Is that right? So first thing we want to do is know what you own, right? From if you're a small mom and pop all the way through a large enterprise, know where your IPs are, know your operating systems, the web apps, web application versions, dependencies, right? Um, you have to know these things so you can figure out when you get those alerts. Next slide, please. When you get those alerts, you'll know what they apply to, right? So you'll know if I see, uh, uh, if I have Windows boxes, I'm going to subscribe to Windows feeds. If I have Red Hat, subscribe to Red Hat feeds. When I say feeds, these are security threat feeds that let you know, hey, these products have patches available. You'll want to you'll want to apply a patch to them, and if you don't want to apply the patch, that's okay. Then Dr. Evil will take care of that for you. Uh, they found in the past that um, certain uh, uh, malware out there would actually, after it gets installed on your system patch the system so other bad guys can't own your system, right? So if you don't patch it, somebody else will after they own it. Um, so what you want to do is apply to those feeds, right? Look at the products you have. There's also some uh, feeds out there, such as the US CERT, that group those feeds together. So if you say, hey, you know what? I don't have the time to submit to each one of these. Well, try to go with the, the ones where it's like, OK, this one's going to send me the Java feeds, the Windows feeds, the Red Hat feeds all together, right? And also get a feel for what out, what's, what's out there in terms of threats, campaigns, right? Uh, is somebody uh, targeting Android devices right now? Is somebody targeting uh, iOS? What are they going after? Uh, next slide, please. So after that, you test. Now here's the cool stuff. Anything in green is free, right? So you don't have to say, Brian, I don't have the money for this. And some of these are even grouped on free distros. Uh, there's one out there, Kali Linux, K-A-L-I Linux. And it has uh, some actual testing tools distinctly for uh, Android. Um, so when we look at these, this is the host scanning software, right? Does anybody here run 
host scanning software? Sam, Mike, right on. Cool. All right. So what it does is this is what's going to let you know if you're missing patches on your OS. Right? It may also let you know if you have some uh, uh, weak ciphers on your IIS side of the house and your web side of the house. The web app scanning, kind of nifty. A lot of, and I don't know where they come up with the names, very creative names for this stuff, um, but I'm starting to see the same thing in the big data tools as well, like, you know, school and all sorts of, where do you come up with the names for this? So anyway, these tools are here for your, uh, they go hand in hand with that um, OWASP. Oh, there's that website right here, right? So you can go to sectools.org, OWASP, get some ideas. Um, really find the right tool for the right job. And then here we go, the mobile application security testing. Um, so you have some Apple uh, uh, tools. You also have your Android tools. Um, damn vulnerable iOS. So tools to actually try to find the vulnerabilities on your, uh, on your uh, systems. Uh, next slide, please. So strongly recommend don't just deploy patches. After you find the holes, test them out, right? Make sure that um, uh, you, uh, have a test environment or a test phone you can try to make sure that the fix works on um, because customers are not going to like an outage and that's not how to maintain their trust, right? So uh, also consider patching schedules and severity that aligns with your risk appetite. You don't have to patch everything, right? You don't have to fix every single thing on there. They have different severity ratings that you can use. That's called a CVSS score. Next slide, please. All right, and that's the big idea. Next slide. The certs, so if you're gonna start using these tools, take some, uh, take some opportunities so that uh, Cali Linux I had mentioned, these guys support. Um, from the certs that I can find out there that are hands-on, uh, these are the ones, if you find some more, please do reach out, let me know, I'll add them to this list. Um, but if you're gonna be using the tools, practicing on your stuff, might as well get a certification that says you were there, you've been there, you have the T-shirt, right? It also may make you more marketable when you wanna go for other opportunities. Um, so, so there you have it. Uh, and reach out to folks. If you see these initials after their names, reach out to them. I, I know we have at least one person here with a couple of these. Um, so reach out to them. Say, you know, find out what works at your skill level and, and opportunity. So next slide. Final thoughts. Break that intrusion kill chain at any opportunity you have, right? Whether it's doing that uh, uh, preventative work or that detective work later on. Whatever you can do, try to break that chain in the processes that you're using. Um, Mitigate the mobile back office and application security problem. We talked about that. Taking on those feeds, looking at what you have in your systems, and really working to uh, get that message, uh, those uh, patches out to the folks that can actually apply them. Um, Self-service, change your oil on your car, right? Save some money. Uh, leverage available security testing resources yourself, right? Learn the stuff, it's fun stuff, right? You'll be able to start understanding your applications better and vulnerabilities in your application. And it's nicer to find it yourself than have somebody else tell you a baby's ugly, right? So. Consider hands-on security certifications. Nice to have access to those tools. Uh, there you have it. Any questions? Yes. Oh, never mind. Yes. Oh, question up front. Uh, do you have any real-life examples of Android um, security issues that you've seen? That prevented or that you discovered or prevented? <laughs> sure. So. Anybody not familiar with uh, Heartbleed? Everybody's familiar with Heartbleed? Okay, so that's an example of a vulnerability. Now, as far as it being exploited on a device, we were able to see it in testing, but I'm not aware of actual instances. Is anybody aware of those actual instances of Heartbleed being, Heartbleed being exploited successfully on a device? No? But now, as far as um, exploits on devices, absolutely. So Darren had just spoken to the one that was in was it North, no, Australia? No, right? So, so there was a condition, though. What was, the, was there a certain condition that allowed that uh, malware to be installed? Well, actually, it wasn't malware. Uh, what it was is someone took over someone's uh, iTunes account. So I'll be speaking a little bit more to that. Okay. That's a, that's a good example of not, uh, mobile device compromise. So Darren works in the mobile security space. He'll be able to, to actually give you some, some shining examples. But the slides before did share some of those uh, over the years, the known, known malware that's come out. I um, mean, I guess if you research any of those, you'll find some of the exploits that have been done on that. But I want to, you have a great point, though. I would not say it's as pervasive as we've seen on the laptops and servers yet. Darren. Got a question. Um, on the slide where you show the certifications, 
Um, are you aware of any mobile security associated certifications, or does anyone in the audience know of any mobile related certifications? It's a good, good question. Okay. Thank you. I'll add that to the list. So you, I don't know if you heard him. He said EC Council or Council has it. Are you aware, Darren, of others? Uh, I, I'm not. I know uh, EC Council does have uh, some training. I know that SANS uh, has some training around mobile, uh, mobile penetration testing. Um, which, which, has a, which has a GIAC cert associated with it. Um, oh, Sam. Here, let me hand you this. Yeah, I was just saying that uh, the SANS training has uh, GIAC certification associated with it. I don't remember what the exact title is, but uh, it is mobile uh, penetration testing or something along those lines. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you.